in case anyone else wants to watch it. Yeah, far away, Sev. Uh, okay, so um, as we are all physios or osteo, we understand MSK problems. And uh, but when we are only physios, we and we, for example, we haven't got any previously, let's say, experience with other problems than MSK. Uh, like, for example, let's say the pathology, so cancer, uh, especially in lower abdomen region. Uh, so later on, when we, when we, uh, when we, let's say, studying and getting more patients with more patients, uh, we can notice that, for example, uh, we clearly having, for example, patient with uh, let's say overtense iliopsoas, and we think from our uh, examination, uh, uh, it, it, it overtense iliopsoas does not cut it with me. Okay, uh, that, so that's not just only... a, this is just a palpatory thing. Overtense, you can't, you can't diagnose overtense iliopsoas. So don't even think about it. Just get it out of your head. Okay. All right. So, uh, so if we have, if we having, for example. Uh, pain in the hip in, for example, active range of motion, uh, which can be, it, can it be caused by, for example, any issues with lower abdomen? Uh, yes, um, but, but you've got to differentiate between a lower abdominal problem and a hip joint problem. Now, if you're talking about something like the hip flex or iliopsoas, it's you've got to really think what, what is my key diagnosis here and, and very few diagnoses are actually anything to do with iliopsoas or um uh, or, or the rectus femoris i mean you might have a little bit of tendinopathy i mean it, it's, it's pretty unusual you can of course tear your iliopsoas i've done mine and um, that's a traumatic injury so that was from kicking a ball and missing a ball i hit the ground with my foot and i tore my iliopsoas couldn't couldn't lift uh couldn't lift my uh, couldn't flex my hip, couldn't get in and out of a car. Um, but they're very, 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 very rare. Um, so we, we, when we look at hip joints, we've got to focus on the most common things, the things that are really likely to turn up on our door. And don't worry too much about the things we don't see. Abdominal problems, abdominal pain, just say to yourself straight away, is this really musculoskeletal? Because most abdominal pain is not musculoskeletal. In fact, is it highly unusual to have a musculoskeletal abdominal problem highly unusual right i mean what could it be i mean what like a like a what like uh, 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 what i mean there's nothing really musculoskeletal that can really affect the abdominal region um you know you don't tend to see um, rectus abdominis tears or strains you don't see tendinopathy here um you know you're much more likely to have a um uh, another issue like a hernia or, or a underlying gallbladder issue or, or, or a, a bowel issue or, or referred pain from a viscera, um, in which case you've got to refer back to the GPs if you're not sure. So I'm always cautious about diagnosing any musculoskeletal problem in the abdomen. And guys, if you get abdominal pain coming in, just refer it back to the GP unless you're 100% sure you know what it is. Okay, uh, yes, understand. Uh, I wanted to, let's say, come back to, le not lately case, but a while ago, I had for a case, uh, it was private patient, basically. Uh, I, what I remember that was low back pain from coming from nothing, but it wasn't in, v uh, in VAS, uh, it wasn't seven out of 10. It was sort of three, four at the beginning uh, and, um, and nothing else or uh, just let me have a look just one moment and as well it was uh, ongoing hip problem hip pain basically uh, and from uh, from diagnosis there was nothing in the hip uh, just while i was palpating the lower abdomen there was some uh, some pain but it wasn't in the region of the uh, in the mass of the muscles uh, it was more some sort of in the region of ovarians, if that in makes sense. In the region sense. of what? Ovarians. Say again. Ovarian. Ovarian. The ovary. The, the ovaries. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, and 
so apart from the normal treatment like uh, we're doing fr from the osteopathy so uh, general osteopathy techniques etc some mobilization of lower back it is but uh, as well i advised uh, to go for uh, gynecologist to that to check uh, because 100%. it was the yeah lady exactly right. and um uh, and they found a little, a little, little cyst, but it was it wasn't anything major, but they found uh, basically cyst. So I was wondering what I could do when I'm working as a FCP with um, with the patient. Shall I uh, as well checking lower abdomen in case, just in case, and referring to the GPs even. Even if, I would, uh, I would look, look, what we've got to determine is, first of all, is there anything really serious going on with our patient? Like, is there a major medical problem here? You know, do we need urgent referral? Do we need to get into a &E? Is there anything really serious going on? Right. And in most cases, the answer is no. OK, so we're going to rule out the really, really serious stuff. Right. And then we're going to say, look, is this a musculoskeletal problem? Um, and quite quickly, you know, if it looks like a pelvic problem, like a female woman's health pelvic problem, it probably is. You know, if it looks like a hip flexor problem or, or a hip osteoarthritis or a, a lumbar spine issue or a femoral nerve entrapment referring pain to the hip, then it probably is. But look, if it looks like there's that, that, that it is and there's associated symptoms of of um, menstrual um, changes um, or, or worsening around menstrual cycles. Um, or uh, any issues like that, um, yeah, UTIs or other pelvic discharges, then of course, absolutely, you 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 say to yourself, this is not a musculoskeletal injury, and I'd like you to go back to your GP and get it reviewed. And that's your scope of practice. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Basically, uh, exclude the red flags, and if ne necessary, refer uh, to the GP. Yeah. 100%. Rule out medical emergencies, exclude red flags, be safe. And then say, this is out of my scope of practice. I don't know. And remember, guys, it's always okay to say, I don't know. And don't be scared. Don't try and come up with random diagnoses or suggestions or, you know, it, it, we don't need to make work diagnoses. Just say, I don't know what's going on. And let's get you to an appropriate person. It might be probably in this case, it will be back to the GP because the GPs are brilliant on pelvic issues and women's self, you know, uh, uh, common women's health issues like period issues and things like that. Um, and so um, I, I would say back to the GP, you know, don't don't stress yourself over it. You know, it's a five, 10 minute consultation. Figure it out it's not a musculoskeletal problem and refer back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, you can take in uh, account, can you hear me? Yeah. So also, can you can take in an account what job he has, and also the rotation of the pelvis. Why is the lower back? How is loading that hip, which is painful? How is loading that side of the the um, pelvis, which is loading? So check the loading. Check the habit. Yeah, they might have repetitive habit. Uh, which can create lower back pain, loading on that side too much, and that creates the pain. Okay, so so yes. lifestyle In factors, yeah, fine. Let's yeah. talk about hip pain, guys. Um, what's the most common form of hip pain? What's the most prevalent hip pain diagnosis? Adductor strain. Um, no. Next. No. You're out. Osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is the most common form of pain in the hip. So straight away, guys, when your hip pain patients come in, you know, what we probably want to see is, you know, are they going into the group, which is the osteoarthritic group? Yeah. Are they the older age group patients? And do they have an osteoarthritis hip? Because it's very, very common. And it's the most common form of hip pain. Okay. What, are, what other um, causes of hip pain do we have? Trochanteric bursitis. Yeah, trochanteric bursitis. So let's talk about that because that's a really commonly missed diagnosis, which is crazy because it's so obvious. But let's chat about trochanteric bursitis in a minute. What else? Yep, so we've got trochanteric bursitis. FAI. FAI. Chat them out. 
Labrum, uh, labrum terra. Labrum terra. Yeah, labrum terra. Good. Gluteal tendinopathy. Gluteal tendinopathy. Gluteus medius tendinopathy. Very good. Yep. Yep. Anything else? That's the common ones, yeah. OA, adductor tears, you, you know, not so common. Tendinopathy is not so common. But your impingements, your labral tears, your OAs, and your greater chalk and tear pain syndromes. Uh, and your less common ones would be fractures. You're not likely to see a fracture, um, but just obviously be mindful if a patient's had a fall, is elderly, and hobbles in, unable to put weight through their leg. They probably won't be walking into the GP surgery. They probably will have got an ambulance hostel by that point. But uh, but but we have had one walk into clinic um, about two years ago when I was uh, was working, um, and they did have a fractured hip. Fell over in the road outside of doctor's surgery, um, and then other things you can think about is referral from the lumbar spine and then that is your, generally your musculoskeletal stuff yeah so we always want to go back to like age group to start with like your OAs obviously your older patients um let's just share with you some sc my screen so you can I've got some slides here from a previous um from a previous um um seven uh, like talk I did um <clears throat> So here's your hip arthritis. Everyone knows what hip arthritis is. I'm going to show you a very easy way to diagnose hip osteoarthritis in a minute. Uh, Kay's going to, going to, going to um, jump, jump on a, uh, the, the, the floor in the lounge and I'll run through it with you. Um, your adductor tears. Look, adductor tears are not common. So you're not going to diagnose them very often. They are almost always um, related to some, some their sports injury. So they're related to sport. Um, you won't see sedentary people at tone and doctor. Um, they are often traumatic. traumatic. Um, I've torn my doctor from stretching. So if you stretch too hard, you can actually um, tear it. Uh, but mostly they're sports injuries. Okay. So. But tear. I saw an elderly people which uh, come to me and I was able to uh, diagnose a doctor's train. They I'm actually very, don't, very, they very don't realize. Surprised. They I'm don't very realize surprised. the movement. Fine. I'm yeah. very surprised. Yeah. It's I very have unusual. Patients, which they get out of bathroom, realize after I keep pushing that it's impossible to do it without a bad movement. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's very unusual, right? Let's look at the common stuff that your elderly patients are more likely to have a hip osteoarthritis. Not always, but look, it's 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 pretty pretty rare. Okay. Um. Adductor strains can be pretty chronic. Can you all see my screen, by the way? Yes. Great. Um, and then you've got adductor tendinopathy. Adductor tendinopathy, we used to say in physio 20 years ago, adductor tendinopathy used to be, in sports physio world, the hardest thing to get rid of. It's the hot, number one hardest thing in the body before supraspinatus um, shoulder impingement. Uh, we always used to say adductor tendinopathy, chronic adductor tendinopathy, absolute nightmare. Horrendous to get rid of um, in the sports world. Um, but we very, very rarely see it coming into GP surgery. Um, now, this is where it starts to get interesting. The hip impingement, which is very misunderstood. Um, and I'm going to run you through it, talk about examination. But a hip impingement and labral tears. Now, you will see these coming into surgery. And they are fairly common. They account for about 25% of your hip pathologies. Okay, so FAI and label tears about 25% of all hip problems. Okay, um, and this is where you get the, 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 the pincer deformity. So I'll just unshare my screen. Um, how do you unshare the screen? Stop share. So imagine, here's your hip joint, yeah. And your hip has a normal physiological range of movement, yeah. Now, a lot of people who, especially female and younger people, so anywhere over the age of 20, 25, um, who try to get excessive range of movement in the hip joint are at risk of labral tears or impingement. So you commonly see this in yoga, yoga instructors and people try and get their, their, their leg up by their, by their ear and people who are 
excessively mobile and hypermobile because what what you're doing is you're essentially you're trying the, the hip would normally stop within its normal physiological range of range. so if you flex the hip it will stop within its normal um its normal range if you try and get a, a, a excessive degrees of flexion something has to give and what has to give is the labrum around the edge of the hip socket so the labrum can tear or you can have actually what happens is if you butt the the the, um, the femoral neck and femur against the um, against the, the 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 superior aspect of the hip joint, you actually can get some extra bone laid down along the superior edge of the um, of the hip joint, or you can get bone laid down on the femoral neck, and that is just just before the the, the femoral head. So where that extra bone is laid down on the top of the of top of the hip joint is called a pincer deformity. So it's like um, I was describing it to Dan yesterday. Where's Dan? Is Dan here? Dan's here. I was saying to Dan that any bony trauma, if you do it long enough, will create a bony reaction. It's like a stress reaction. So if I whack my elbow against the table repeatedly for six months, I'll start to get bone laid down on the edge of my elbow because it's like a stress reaction. So the body lays down bone to protect bone. And so if you constantly butt against the top of a hip joint, exactly the same way of osteoarthritis as well with where you get extra osteophytes laid down you can get a little pincer deformity so it's a little extra bone laid down or you can get where the where the where the button occurs on the bone on the before the femoral head you can get bone laid down it's called a cam deformity that's impingement and it goes hand in hand with labral tears you usually see one or the other um and it's very hard to differentiate between the two but it doesn't really matter because they're virtually the same thing uh and they're diagnosed exactly the same way and I tell my patients it's either a label cell as an impingement. Um, and they're almost always hypermobile patients. Um, and we'll talk about it in a second in terms of examination. So uh, you can get degenerative label tears as well, um, of course. So you see them in osteoarthritis, of course. Look, with osteoarthritis, you lose everything. You lose the, the labrum is gone osteophytes around the, the the head of the femur and the socket um and um, um and uh, you can get obviously a vascular necrosis with the with the hip joint am i losing anyone yeah if i'm losing you it's fine to say uh and then you've got gluteus medius tendinopathy yeah so gluteus medius tendinopathy is your pain right above your 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 trochanter so there's trochanter there. There's gluteus medius around there, sort of coming alongside the, the, the glute. And you get this, it's a runner's problem usually. Um, so usually sports, but you get this gluteus medius tendinopathy. Um, anyone, and of course, trochanteropsitis. So nowadays we tend to call trochanteropsitis. We always used to call it trochanteropsitis, but now we tend to call it, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, greater trochanteric pain syndrome. So greater truck and tear pain syndrome is this new idea that's come out um, that basically, or truck and tear pain syndrome, either or, but the same thing, is this idea that, um, that, that, that it's, um, it, there's not as many bursitis as they originally thought there was, right? So we always used to diagnose truck and tear bursitis, but now they're sort of saying, well, is it really truck and tear bursitis? because it's a little bit dubious how much bursitis there actually is. And actually, it often is quite a lot of tendinopathy. And we see this diagnosed on MRI a lot, um, this gluteus medius tendinopathy. So they've now kind of put it under the same umbrella as greater truck and tear pain syndrome, which basically means it's either bursitis or it's gluteus medius tendinopathy. Uh, and they kind of can occur together as well. And patients often come in and say they've either got pain right on the trochanter, right on the trochanter, or just above it. And um, so you kind of, we just call it greater trochanter pain syndrome. Um, but it's always lateral pain, and it often radiates down the leg. And the key factor is they often have trouble sleeping on it. And so if they've got lateral hip pain, you often see them with hip osteoarthritis as well. So don't be afraid. You can have a hip osteoarthritis and, and a truck and tear pain syndrome. But if they come in with natural hip pain, straight away say to yourself, is this truck and tear pain syndrome, greater truck and tear pain syndrome? Is it? Is it, is it truck and tear bursitis? Is it, is it gluteus medius tendinopathy? It doesn't matter. 
is it greater trochanteric pain syndrome? Because it's lateral hip pain. And all you have to do is do the poke test, stand them up and poke on the trochanter, trochanters, and see if it hurts. And ask them simple questions. Does it hurt when you sleep on it, on, on your side? Um, have you, uh, it's usually secondary to a change in gait. So often they'll report six months before spraining an ankle or, um, or having surgery on an ankle. I've just had one come in that wanted an injection in, in, for trochanteropositis and she'd had an ankle operation a few months before. And you often see that. So changing gait seems to disrupt the biomechanics of pelvis. And then you seem to get this irritation on the bursa. Um, okay. Uh, let's just share my screen again with you. Uh, share screen. Uh, so uh, 10 to 20% of hip pain patients are greater trock and tap pain syndrome, by the way. Um, and causes weakness of hip abductors, apparently, or compressive forces at the gluteal tendons. Uh, let's skip on to ischial bursitis. You won't see it very commonly. Ischial bursitis, obviously, weaver's bottom. So people that sit on hard, hard, hard chairs basically get pain at the bottom of the backside. Um, femoral fractures, hip replacements, um, femoral nerve entrapments. You will see femoral nerve entrapments. Uh, it can be difficult to diagnose. Uh, L3, 4, L2, 3 sort of area um, tends to send pain down the front of the anterior part of the leg. Um, it's usually diagnosed just simply by you know there's only tends to be two or three things that send pain down the front of a leg usually it's either hip osteoarthritis or it's trochanteropositis or it's which is tends to be a bit more lateral or it's femoral nerve entrapment from the lumbar spine which is usually caused by a disc problem so disc herniation um impingement onto the uh, femoral nerve and leg radiations down the front of a leg uh, usually to the knee, not usually any further, but can be. Right, I'm going to go into the lounge and run through some hip examinations, and I won't throw anything you want at me. Just throw it all up. So have a think about any questions you might have, and I'm going to shoot in there now. See you in a sec. Yo, 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 here we are. <laughs> right. Um, so has anyone got any questions? No. How do I make me big? Anyone got any questions? OK, I'm just going to go and shut that camera down. How would you, Tim, in the clinic differentiate between FAI and a label tear? Can you hear uh, Can you hear anybody on this? Hey, Dan. Hey, Tim. How would you clinically diagnose or differentiate between FAI and a labral tear? Uh, extremely difficult. I don't even bother. Simple. Yeah, fair. So you can, um, I wouldn't say I do it with any accuracy at all. Okay. But pr probably it happening. Okay, so no MRI, I mean, even, MRI um, even on MRI, it's not particularly accurate because uh, you often won't see small label tails on MRI. So you'd need to have um, gadolinium injections. You'd need an MRA. Um, yeah. so, um, so MRI would show hip impingement because you'd see the, you'd see the cancer of oh, hand deformity. I have no idea how this, um, how does this sound go up? On the side. Oh, there it is. Um, so it's not easy now you might see certain signs i think you might see uh, you might get a bit of a clunk or a reproducible clunk 
not often other people talk about this but i don't see it that often uh, and it's not that easy really to diagnose between the two so i simply say look it's it's, it's, it's probably either an impingement or a labral tear um and um it, that's assuming it's a young person if it's an older person you can have obviously like i said generative labral tear but again that's much more like related to osteoarthritis so you'd be more likely to diagnose them with a with like a mild or moderate osteoarthritis of the hip so let's have a look at hip is that any, anyone else want to um, want to uh <laughs> very good model here right uh, let's see if i can Yeah. Okay. Um, so the key thing to um, really, when you examine your hips, is does my hip flex? Okay. Does my patient's hip actually flex? Does the hip actually bend? Because that tells you more information than anything else you can do. Is does it flex? Okay. And to what angle does it flex? I get a goniometer out and I measure it. Um, you you don't have that in FCP. But you don't need. You can easily eyeball it. You know, and if the hip doesn't flex past 90 degrees, you're usually looking at a pretty severe osteoarthritis. So the general rule of thumb is if it goes to 90 degrees and doesn't go any further and it's a hard end feel, that's a pretty, that's total hip replacement territory. OK, and then any other, any amount, of, there's so 90 degrees, 100 degrees, 110 degrees, 20 degrees, 130 degrees, 140 degrees plus 140 plus. OK. Now, if they're really, really, really flexible, like K is super flexible for our hips, again, start thinking like labral issues, a labral uh, problem going on here. Now, examination, what else can we do in some examination? So I, first of all, I just flex my hips and then I'll often just go through a sort of a, like a, I mean, generally you call it like, so when we do special tests on the hip, um, actually, before we do special tests, let's actually just check flexion, Let's check um, at full abduction. Yeah, let's see how far the hip will abduct. You can always put the uh, put the other side down, just abduct and see how see whether they, they abduct. And that's just again to see if they've got an osteoarthritis. Um, so with an, with a with a gross osteoarthritis, you lose abduction. Um, and then you might just want to check internal rotation. Okay. So just. I'm trying to do this one hand internally and externally. So you'd normally expect around um, 30 to 35 degrees of internal rotation. Yep. Uh, okay, it's got at uh, least 40 degrees there. And, um, and you'd expect 45 degrees of external rotation. So you're looking for joint stiffness. Okay. Um, so that's in externally rotate and internal rotate. Now, then it doesn't really matter, right? the special tests so you don't even have to remember fabers and and fadiers and uh, 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 and all that stuff it, it doesn't really matter because actually they all kind of do the same thing and that what you're trying to do is basically see whether when you take the hip joint in the full flexion you can wind it up to create an impingement or a pain on the hip joint so you're test it's like you're going to test you're going to like really challenge the head of a femur to see how well it moves in a joint so all of these tests are basically designed to tell you is this a problem at the actual hip joint or is this just a functional problem yeah and always keep that in your mind so i want to come right up so i can go in like a quadrant test like a quadrant test will be sort of going through different um, amounts of flexion and then abduction to adduction and just sort of testing it in different amounts of, oh, bit of a bit of a, a clunky, <laughs> bit of a pinchy there, bit of a clunk there. Now you see, K hypermobile, yeah. Like I said, she's hypermobile. I've never examined K's hip, but you know, I'm clearly getting a little bit of an impingement sign here on flexion with adduction. You know, again, you see, so you can just test. You can test the the, the superior aspect of the joint by going through flexion with abduction or adduction. Now, if you really want to wind up the hip joint, you know, again, you don't need to remember this, but but you can do a you can do a, a flexion with adduction and internal rotation. So you can do a, a fadiers test. It doesn't really matter what it's called. You just wind up the joint by internally rotating it and flexing it. 
or you can really wind up by internally rotating it, flexing it, and adapting it. And then, yeah. Okay, Kay's like sort of rinsing right now. Right, so that's definitely a little bit of an impingement sign on the hip because, and, and like I said, it doesn't, imp it won't just show impingement because it can show labral tear, it can show osteoarthritis because it doesn't really matter. What it's telling you is that the problem is at the actual hip ball and socket joint. Yeah, this feels Tim, so on that on that point, that's a good point in terms of it doesn't really matter what it's telling you. I think it's a highly sensitive test. So if it's negative for the for deer, you can be quietly confident that it's not impingement. Exactly right. Of, exactly. So the point is, you know, if these tests are coming up negative, it's probably not anything really at the hip joint. All right, it's not labrum, it's not impingement, it's not osteoarthritis. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, you've so fadir's test, so fadir flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Yeah, um, you, you've got a quadrant, which is kind of like a sort of a scar, a scar test. So you sort of come through at different angles of flexion. You've got um, Pat Patrick's test or Faber's fa Faber's so same thing. Um, what is flexion, a flexion, abduction, and external rotation? Um, you, you keep the, the keep the 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 the, the um, the, you can keep a hand on the, the other side and you're just seeing how far down the, the, the leg will go um, or if it replicates any groin pain. Um, and, and again, that tells you, of course, it can be an adductor sign if they're very, very tight in the adductors. If you want to test if they're torn the adductor, uh, you know, all you have to do is, it, it, well, you, you'll know for clinical question, you'll know straight away if they're torn the adductor. Right, but but just resist, just resist um, adduction of the hip. So just just get them to resist against against your hand, or you can squeeze both hands and, and just see. Um, you can do it in a sideline position as well if you want. Um, but that will pretty quickly tell you if they're torn the adductor because it'll replicate pain. Um, so hip, hip flexor tendon knobby, uncommon. You don't see it very often. It's usually a functional diagnosis, so it's usually something that's not replicable. So you won't see two physicians or two doctors diagnosing um, hip flexor tendinopathy because it's a very um, subjective um, diagnosis. Um, Trochanteopsitis, so just push the trochanter and see if it hurts. Does that hurt, Kay? They They can be a bit tender, so if that's why you always poke both sides. So you just poke both sides and say, is there any difference between between the sides, mm. yeah, they're both tender. Both, both, both tender, but you know, one if they're both tender, it's probably normal. But if one side um, and they go, ah, that's really painful, then that's a really good sign for truck and tear or greater truck and tear pain syndrome because it kind of is the same thing. We think we don't know. This is what people are suggesting. Yeah, and so look, in terms of your diagnosis, it's so easy, guys. It's so 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 easy because. If they're older and they've got a really stiff hip, they can't go past 90 degrees, then it's probably a really quite bad osteoarthritis. If they can get to 120 degrees, then it's usually not, but not always, but usually, right? If they've got good hip flexion, it means that basically the, the, bow, the, 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 the osteophytes and the excess bone that's laid down with osteoarthritis hasn't really formed. So it means that if they have got osteoarthritis, it's probably quite mild. Um, so just test the hip through different angles and see at the hip joint what's going on. If you've got lateral hip pain, then think trochanteopsitis, yeah? And if they've got pain radiating down the front of the leg, then think osteoarthritis or referred pain from, from femoral nerve or from trochanter, usually down the side, but it can go down the front of the leg, okay? And... If it's at the hip joint, so if you can wind it up through rotating and flexing or externally rotating and flexing or adducting and flexing, then you're looking at, you know, an osteoarthritis in an old person or a, a hip impingement, stroke labrum tear in a younger person. And that's as easy as hip diagnosis is. And if you do that 95% of the time, you're going to be right with your diagnosis. That's me done. Any questions? Feel free. To turn on your mics. Turn on your 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 um your your, your cameras and feel free to challenge me. I'm showing about the blood testing. Oh. Hey Tim, it's it's uh, it's Lucky. How are you doing? Hey Lucky. What tests would you do to differentiate 
lumbar radicular pain and uh, greater trochanteric bursitis where it's traveling down the outside of the leg. Um, you, um, okay, what test would you do? Well, normally, if they've got a femoral nerve impingement, they'll hate you for lying on their back with their leg straight, to be honest. Oh, sorry, from the, from the nerve root, not, not peripheral. Like oh. a spinal nerve entrapment. Well, uh, um, your reflexes? Um, yeah, you could do a neuro test. Um, you could do range of movement tests in the lumbar spine and see if any yep. of the movements refer pain down, like flexion, for example, might aggravate pain down the leg or extension might do if it's if it's uh, if there's a disc problem. Um, so uh, I, I would do those or there, there are other, some other tests I don't even remember. Um, some yeah. 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 provocation tests, uh, but I, I don't use them. Uh, and, and then if you want to differentiate between chalk and tap sites, just press the trochanter and ask them if they sleep, when they sleep on it, does it hurt? When they sleep yeah. on the side, does it hurt? And that's good enough usually. Um, that will get most people, that, that will get you diagnosed with most people. I was going to say the key, the key things I look at would be the back movement will hurt if it's from lumbar nerve root and if it's trochanteric bursitis, the other two tests you could do along with palpating would be single leg stance. So if the pain comes on with probably 10 to 20 seconds of standing on one leg, lateral hip, that's quite a good test for trochanteric bursitis. And then probably the other one I would do would be resisted hip abduction. Yeah, fine. That's yeah. Good. All right, anyone else? Any, any other questions? Um, hi, Tim. Shreya here. Um, uh, hey, Shreya, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, how would you differentiate between sacroiliac pain or and hip pain? Because even when we're doing hip flexion passively, just because of the lower back pain as well, they try to restrict it, if that makes sense. Okay, so first uh, of all, I'll just shout and say I'm not the big world's biggest fan of diagnosing sacroiliac problems, okay. okay? Because I always ask myself, and having seen hundreds of sacroiliac joints on MRI scans, mm -hmm. where you very rarely see a clear diagnosis with a sacroiliac joint, I'm always dubious about diagnosing sacroiliac joints. What's the degrees of movement, Tim? What's two or three degrees, if that? Three degrees. Yeah, two or three, yeah. maybe four to six degrees in females, two to four degrees in males. Um, but that's dubious. Um, there is a tiny yeah. bit of movement in that joint, but generally, because it doesn't move much, it doesn't tend to hurt much. You can get osteoarthritis of a sacroiliac joints, but it's unusual. You can also get um, um, you can get uh, bony um, osteophytes around the sacroiliac joints, which can be a sign of um, ankylosing spondylitis. And there are a lot of osteopaths that believe, and I I'm also in favour of this, but you can get instability of the of the sacroiliac joints following childbirth um, or hypermobility um but and that can cause some shearing which can cause inflammation on the sacroiliac joints um but we don't see it that often so i don't tend to diagnose a lot of sacroiliac joints so i always look at a lumbar spine share and straight away i always say is this actually a lumbar spine problem just radiating to this to the sij so i always right. look, i mean do, do you like ability wise chances are it's going to be a lumbar spine disc problem. Right. Can that also radiate down to your groin and the front of the thigh then? So if you're right. Sacroiliac oh. joints can radiate to the groin. Yeah. Uh, so how would you differentiate that? But with the hip, really yeah. Yeah. can refer to the groin as well. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, SIJs can refer to the groin, right? Um, yeah. As can, as can upper lumbar discs. So, so mm -hmm. L1 discs. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But if you want to really wind up the sacroiliac joint, just, just flex and add up the hip. And then you can actually just push, mm. compress. Press it down. Yeah, you can press yeah, through. Yeah. Go into adduction. And actually, some go into abduction when they can press through. But mm -hmm. look, there is no reliable sacroiliac joint test. It doesn't matter whether you do the compression test, like I showed, it doesn't matter if you do the stalk test. It doesn't matter if you did a flexion test. It doesn't matter if you did a pinch test on the PSISs. There's no viable SIJ test that I've done. And I've used hundreds of them. I've tried them hundreds of times. And you know what? I gave up on them. Now I don't even bother testing the sacred credit joint because I don't think it's reliable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't back to it. So I just do it by clinical history. 
if they've got sacroiliac joint pain, I go, does the pain hurt there? Just turn around to me, just line in front. Look, if they've got sacroiliac joint pain, I just yeah. press on the sacroiliac joint pain. Is that painful? And, right. and then find out if it's a localised pain. That's a good start. And if you line back, and if it's referring pain to the groin, then I'll just do a hip exam. Right, okay. Yeah. And see whether it's actually a hip joint problem or whether it is a sacroiliac joint problem or see if it's a lumbar spine, an L5-S1 disc problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank but you. If you diagnose, but, yeah. but don't diagnose many SIJs because this mm -hmm. is a big thing we see in osteopathy and chiropractic right. is hyper diagnosis for SIJ problems. And in reality, that's, you don't, we're not really sure whether there's as many as people think. Yeah. How, yeah. Uh, sorry, on that point, Tim, I think it, the biggest question is if it's referred pain from the lumbar spine or, or sacroiliac pain, I think if you ask yourself, how is this going to change management? It doesn't it, really matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Exactly right. I mean, how's it changed management? I mean, what you're still probably going to, you might give some stretches, you're probably going to give some lumbar spine mobility exercises. It's not an easy way to mobilize the sacroiliac joint. So, how are you going to mobilize it? Not very easily. So, you're probably going to give lumbar spine exercises anyway. You're probably going to give some core strengthening or some back strengthening exercises. Yeah. Change management doesn't. Mm -hmm. Can I just say something? Yeah. And also, I mean, at, um, as an osteopath and seeing um, lots of osteopaths diagnose SIJ problems, and then suddenly, actually, it's been going on for like a year, and the patient goes and has an MRI and it shows there's a disc problem. It just looks slightly um, incompetent that, you know, a, a practitioner's kind of working with this diagnosis of, of an SIJ and actually the whole time it's been a disc issue it just I think if you've got it in the back of your mind it's probably more likely to be a disc issue than an SIJ it looks like you've you've not discarded it do you know what I mean it's, it's been in the forefront of your mind yeah more likely to... absolutely just like think of probabilities your your number of SIJ problems are going to be really 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 small like true SIJ problems are probably going to be pretty small so they're yeah. not I mean, very often. I, mean, I, I can't think of a single F FCP session I've done where I've seen an SIJ pain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Anyone else want to throw anything at us? Go and chuck at us. Tim, if you, so if you do your assessment and the hip joint is provocative, what are some red flag conditions you've seen over the years? I think you've seen, first of all, no serious red flag conditions affected to a provocative hip joint examination. And okay. you take see them. The really serious ones are going to be in that area just a quarter equina, which you're not really going to see causing a problem with a hip joint. So you, you would spot that. You would spot a quarter equina. So and it's anything really serious. I, I guess probably you're really looking for, for serious things with a hip joint would be uh, would, would be an osteoporotic uh, a fracture osteoporosis or a vascular necrosis mm. but again yeah. they're re they're really you know they're, they're they're coupled with osteoarthritis so so the management would be yeah. you know you see a very quickly deteriorating i've seen it very quickly deteriorating osteoarthritis of a hip it's usually a a vascular necrosis um, and what 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 potential can't wait Sorry, to go go on. Through. yeah that's the that's they're the elderly people that come in and they really badly limp they're the really bad osteoarthritis or avascular necrosis. So if you get those presentations coming in and they've got a bad limp and their hip pain's not going away, do you think it's important to get an X-ray with all those patients? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd yeah. absolutely X-ray them and I would refer them and or refer them for, for, for to consultation uh, to, to the MSK CATS or to the uh, pathway to the orthopedics team to get with a, an opinion and if they're the right, you know, assuming that they're, they're probably going to be in their mid to late, early 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, early 80s, etc. You know, they're probably going to be of this age group. So we're thinking really, you know, it's probably going to be a quite a severe hip arthritis. And that's going to be the majority of your hip patients. Yeah. They're going to be 75% of them are going to be hip osteoarthritis. So again, look at the probabilities. Look at, this is what the research tells us. So the hip joint pains that are coming in, they're probably going to be older people. They're probably going to hit be hip osteoarthritis. Determine the severity of hip osteoarthritis, not through x-ray, 
but through joint examination. You don't need an x-ray to diagnose osteoarthritis of the hip. You just need to examine the joints, see how flexible they are, usually, and see how much that hip bends. The worse it bends, the more the hip osteoarthritis as a general rule of thumb. And if they don't go past 90 degrees, that's a good sign. Quite bad as osteoarthritis. You've tried the exercises, you're not getting better. You have a good age to go for hip placement. Let's get you to the orthopedics team for um, for a review. Yeah, Jim, you exactly. Reckon... I've, oh, sorry. sorry, Dan, if I just cut in, I was, I've, I've seen two AVNs this year. And I mean, I wasn't thinking that at the forefront straight away, but I think the key thing is if it's been two, three months, even if you're just referring on to another physio, it can't hurt to get an x-ray. It takes about a week to get the results back. Even if you're not thinking the CATS team, uh, definitely can't hurt to get an x-ray. You're absolutely yeah. right. Guys, if you're not sure, you know, you've always got an option to send that patient for an x-ray. And it's exactly what the GPs will do. And you know what? People will say, Tim, it's not good practice. But you know what? If you're not sure and it's not getting better and they're really struggling with it and they're limping and they're having problems and they're not getting better with the exercises, send them for an x-ray. It's fine. You know, it's exactly what a GP would do. And let's get a, let's get an x-ray and see what's going on. Just on the x-ray note, what do you write on the x-ray form? Do you write pelvis so you can get both hips? Always. And a comparative? Yeah. Always, do, I always yeah, go for a, for a pelvic x-ray. Perfect. Yeah. Any final um, question? Yeah, one one final. Um, in terms of diagnosing hip OA with um, range of motion, would you say internal rotation is more indicative or a restriction or loss of internal rotation compared to abduction or not necessarily? It varies. Uh, usually I say internal rotation is part. Uh, but but I find it varies. Uh, but I think that the best indicator for hip osteoarthritis is flexion. But I do find hip internal rotation is usually grossly limited with hip osteoarthritis. Sometimes you'll go right down to zero degrees of internal rotation. And yeah. it'd be a rock hard feel. And I, you can just eyeball it. You know, you know, normal range of internal rotation is 30 to 35 degrees. So if they've lost internal rotation, you start to think straight away. Did have a stiff joint? Did have an osteoarthritic joint? Is there osteophytes and a, a hypertrophy of the joint? Is there, is there bone laid down around the joint? Is, is, is there cartilage loss around the joint? What's the youngest person you've seen with uh, OA hip? 40s. 32. 32 there. I've seen bilateral one in their 40s. Um, They've had a congenital yeah. problem when they're yeah. younger. Yeah, so yeah. congenital, so about 30% of early hip arthritis are due to congenital abnormalities at birth. Yeah. Yeah, so if they come in with a grossly limited hip range of movement, a hard hip range, where you put it through flexion or in terms of, and it's hard, bony end feel, and they're in their 40s, it's a early hip arthritis. And that's probably congenital, like almost certainly congenital from, from birth. And yeah. Going for a while. They'd had on going for a while. They'd had aching around the hip and back probably for for, for, for a few years on and off. Uh, and I do, I, they do pop in. They do come in every now and again. But always look for that hard, bony end of range, restricted end of range. That's your hip joint telling you that you've lost the congruity, space. the space. You've lost the congruity of the ball and socket. The ball is not going in and around that socket very well. Last questions? One more, Tim. Hey. Um, oh, sorry, was someone else going to hey, A really hard one, Lucky. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to talk about if you do an assessment with an adolescent or a paediatric and your hip joint assessment is positive what is there a different approach you might take to management and are there any conditions you're looking out for yeah just i always straight away any kid with any kid with hip pain any kid x-ray <laughs> don't even i mean look unless unless look unless like me when i was a kid i kicked the ball and and, and, and whacked my foot and i had a clear obvious tear in my hip flexor, right? Look, but if if any 
kids come in, it's just to me, it's a red flag, right? And you know, you want to be careful with your your perfes and your slip femoral epiphyses. And you know, if kids come in and they're limping, it's a red flag. If kids come in and their leg gives way, it's a red flag. If kids come in and they're getting general pain around the groin, it's a red flag. And of course, just be mindful of testicular boys and testicles, referring pain, check the testicles of females, obviously, um, but things like that, like testicular cancer, not very common, obviously, but, but just keep an open mind. But kids with hip pain, and be careful because you can have osteosarcomas around the hip. You can have osteosarcomas around the pelvis. It's extremely dangerous and very, very, very damaging and very, 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 very dangerous. So you know what, if they're kids and they come in, just get, get them checked, get them x-rayed, unless it's a really obvious, obvious sports injury. Perfect. Guys, stay safe. Don't take chances. If you're not sure, get a second opinion. You don't have to know everything. If it's out of your scope, you just say it's out of my scope, I don't know. Let's get a doctor to have a look at you, yeah? Don't try and fix everything. If you're not sure, get a second opinion. Talk to us, talk to me, talk to anyone of the team. Post it on the WhatsApp group. Call us, WhatsApp. If you're not sure, speak to the GP, speak to the duty doctor on site. You know, there's lots of options. The buck never has to end with you. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your evening, yeah? Thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.